So, good morning everyone. This lecture is going to be on ultra high performance concrete and its material design and properties. So, we will cover the material design part of ultra high performance concrete for the first 30 minutes and then the next 20 25 minutes on properties of uh, UHPC. So, we have conventional concretes that typically have strength of 20 to 25 mega Pascal up to 50 mega Pascal for high performance concrete and can go up to about 100 mega Pascal in that case. But uh, ultra high performance concrete are designed with a compressive strength of 150 mega Pascal or about 25,000 pounds per square inch. And they are also designed for a high tensile strength of about 10 mega Pascal. You achieve this by extremely dense packing of particles, make the microstructure so dense so that the particles are so close to each other, stresses are transferred very nicely. You add quite a bit of steel fibers to these uh, materials so that you increase the ductility of these members and then you have an extremely low water binder ratio that will help uh, get a very high packing and very low porosity. So, it is a combined effort of, of reducing the water cement ratio, improving the particle packing and using steel fibers to improve the ductility. Right. So, uh, again high compressive strength is not just enough, you can have high compressive strength for certain applications, but you need high ductility, high resistance to corrosion and aspects of durability also in, in ultra high performance concretes. So, um, the idea is that you can tailor the material microstructure through careful selection of materials, careful design of the constituents and proper construction practices to get you really high properties. So, that is the core idea of designing UHPC. Now, what are the some of the advantages that you do not have with conventional concretes? Now, you can say strength right, you can you can get strengths of with, with high performance concretes you can get strength of up to 100, 100 mega Pascal. But in conventional concrete if you have a really heavy load bearing member like a bridge girder or a bridge column that is supposed to carry extremely high loads, you need extremely tight rebar cages. So, if you have such tight rebar cages uh, and you have so much of steel, it obviously increases the cost of the structural member and you need such kind of uh, extremely dense reinforcement to control shear cracking. With enhanced tensile strength, you can reduce the uh, shear cracking by improving the shear strength and also the tensile cracking is reduced. The fiber reinforcement, the discrete fiber reinforcement, steel reinforced steel fibers that are spread uh, in a discrete fashion in UHPC helps maintain the tensile capacity beyond cracking which means you have high ductility of the member. The increased ductility reduces the need for excessive shear reinforcement, so you can control shear reinforcement and uh, if you have such very high strength for your concrete, your development length for your rebars can be reduced. So, you have lot of these advantages which you do not get in, in conventional concretes through UHPC. A few applications it has been used in the United States for a few years now for very selected um, applications. These are a couple of bridges, Mars Hill Bridge in Iowa, Cat Point Creek Bridge in, um, in Virginia. These are some of the bridges that have used UHPCs in uh, its construction. The way they normally want to use UHPC is for bridge decks because bridge decks are supposedly very heavy load carrying members and are supposed to last for a much longer period of time. So, you use it for bridge decks, but before uh, UHPC was used for bridge decks, the more um, critical application was uh, bridge connections. When you have precast concrete bridges, you can do normal high performance precast bridge decks, but when you bring on to the site, you need to join the precast bridges right. And as you know, for any connection, uh, for any chain the, the weak links is a connection. So, if you have those connections which are normally side cast concrete, if you do not have really good quality control those connections are normally weak and these connections if you if you can think of vehicles driving through a bridge, you can think of these connections being subjected to extreme fatigue loading right. So, you will have much faster failure of those connections. They used steel connections to improve that, but then steel and concrete you have issues with corrosion. Uh, so, UHPC is now a preferred option to connect girders. 
Um, you can do UHPC bridges, complete bridge decks like you see in those pictures. You can have UHPC overlays for bridges. Existing bridges, you want to retrofit them for higher traffic, you can have a thinner uh, 3 inch, 4 inch thick overlay for, for bridges. You can have column encasings, you can have uh, a column for a bridge that is now required to take a higher load, you can encase that column with UHPC very similar to encasing concrete columns in steel. Right, so as a, as a retrofit methodology. So, a lot of applications, structural design is going to be different, but I will concentrate mostly on the materials part in this talk. These are again UHPC pi girders, pi girders are called pi girders because they have the shape of the Greek alphabet pi and these are very common uh, bridge girder elements. So, pi girders are very common, so Jackway Park Bridge in Iowa, you can see pi, bird, pi girders being, being implemented. Okay, field connections like I talked about. You can have deck level connections, connections at the deck level where the bridge deck, two panels of the deck are connected by UHPC like you see in these figures or you can have the deck or the girder connected to the support structure also through UHPC. So, multiple ways of doing it. Uh, the connections, the advantage of say, such extreme high strength is that the connections can be small and you are always better off doing smaller connections than larger connections because connections are the weak points. So, you can now afford to have smaller connections and you do not require post, post tensioning of concrete within those connections because this have extremely high strength, extremely high tensile strength also. Okay. So, let us talk about material design, let us talk about how do you design uh, ultra high performance concrete for such very high strengths and very high durability. The idea is there are commercial mixtures. Um, you can buy commercial UHPC mixtures um, for about $2000 per cubic meter. Extremely expensive to give you perspective, a conventional concrete costs about $125 a cubic meter. So, you are talking about 15 to 20 times the cost because these materials are proprietary and they use very special admixtures and additives. But the idea is to make the science simpler to show that you can make these materials with locally available raw materials, you do not have to go to very fancy uh, powders and, and chemical admixtures, you can actually make it with local admixtures, local, locally available materials if you control what you choose to put in your concrete and how you make your concrete really, really well. You need extremely high admixture dosage because your water cement ratio is going to be very low, we are talking about water cement ratios lower than 0.2. Okay. So, it has to be a lot of admixtures. Um, now, we talked about connections, right? If you have to do connections, the concrete has to be self compacting to go and be poured into connections. I also showed you very dense reinforcement uh, caging. If you have to get concrete into that, you need really, really flowable self compacting concrete. So, the one of the challenges is a 0.2 water cement ratio and to get it self compacting that is one of the biggest challenges and then you want to look at packing of particles, you want to make sure that the powders are extremely well packed and for that you need a range of powders, right. If, so, if you remember the science of packing, not one size will be able to fill in a space well, right. You need a gradation of sizes so that every space is sequentially filled and we have to do it with all the different size ranges. So, if you look at concrete, you have size ranges starting from 5, 10 millimeter, 20 millimeter size aggregates to sub micron particles of silica fume. So, you have such a vast size distribution, the other challenge is make sure that you have enough uh, particles in all these size ranges to fill the pores really well, use a lot of admixtures to make sure that this make, be, gets really well flowing and you can pour your concrete well into all these very tiny areas. So, that is a challenge. So, we will we'll attack this problem in two different stages. Like I said, two different ways of doing, you can deck and uh, girder connection uh, or you can connection, you can have connection between deck panels, um, you can see <coughs> the reinforcement in both cases being different. So, here are some of the common uh, ultra high performance mixtures available in the market, these are mostly commercial mixtures, I have put the conversion between pounds per cubic yard and kilograms per cubic meter for you to, to quickly uh, make the conversion. 
And the first thing that you notice is very high amount of cement, right? Very high amount of Portland cement. You need that for two different reasons. One, my water cement ratio is very low, which means only a small fraction of cement is going to be hydrating. If only a small fraction of cement is going to be hydrating, I need more of cement to make up enough of the reaction product. That's one reason why I need a lot of cement. And then second is that I need a lot of fine powders, cement being a fine powder, the property of which you know really, really well that you can control. So that's why two reasons why people do high amounts of cement. The downside, high shrinkage. So and that's why this has to be really, really well controlled in terms of curing and in terms of using materials like uh, internal curing admixture, super absorbent polymers and things like that. Now, I have put an arrow on fine sand in all these slides. You will see that one of the reasons is that sand is pretty much the only aggregate in ultra high performance concrete. The reason being again, you are basically looking at an ultra high performance mortar, generally all the commercial mixtures, but I will show you actually how to design ultra high performance concrete. The reason why everybody uses mortar is to control mortar properties is much easier than controlling concrete properties. Anybody, anybody who has worked with concrete and mortar know if you want to look at flowability, mortar is much more controllable as far as flowability is concerned than concrete because in mortar you rarely have the problems of bleeding and segregation. Whereas with concrete you end up with bleeding and segregation if your quantities are not proportioned correctly. So one reason why we have uh, most ultra high performance concrete using sand is to make sure that that flowability criteria is satisfied. And also you will see in these um, in these uh, tables a lot of other fine powders. There is silica fume, there is ground quartz, um, there is lot of different types of fine powders people use. Again the idea is to make sure that you have a wider particle size distribution to fill in all the pores. So some few mixtures that, that people have tried in the past. Okay, so how do we design this material? How do we start designing it from first principles? So you have to select what binder materials you actually want and that is the most important part. Cement is a given, you need it. What other than cement? What are the common ideas that we have to select materials other than cement? One is sustainability. You, ca you have to make sure that you are using less cement as possible so you can use a lot of other base materials. The other aspect is your cement has a certain size distribution. If you look at particle size distribution of cement and I will show you that in a while, you will have sizes from 1 micron roughly to about 100 microns normally distributed, right? What happens to sizes smaller than 1? More than 100 we do not bother because sand will fill in those spaces. What about sizes smaller than 1? What can we use? The thing that comes to mind quickly is silica fume generally, right? So you have to now have materials that are smaller than, uh, than uh, 1 micron which is silica fume. You can have metacalin also which is, uh, which is another material that you can use if you need some aluminate effect in it. And I will show you, we have used both silica fume and metacalin, I will tell you why we have done that. Then you have to ensure that the particles are packed really well. You have to pack them really well like I told you before. Not just packing, you have to ensure that they are reactive enough, right? So what is mostly reacting in your system initially? It is a cement and all the other materials that you put in are helping cement do its job better. For example, if you put in silica fume, silica fume at very early ages acts as nucleation agents, nucleation sites. So all those materials are helping cement which means you have to put those particles, not just put them in a volume ensure that they are distributed enough for the cement to do its job. And remember all of these are happening at a water binder ratio of 0.16 or 0.18. So now that is challenge is to make sure that all these family of materials act synergistically at that low water cement ratio, challenge number one. Getting to aggregates, I can avoid aggregates completely and have a self consolidating UHPC mortar. But the problem of not having aggregates is dimensional stability. Your shrinkage is going to be much higher if you do not have aggregates. What size of aggregates then can I use? I cannot use larger 25 mm aggregates because it won't flow. The space between the rebars is probably 10 or 15 mm. So I need very, very small aggregates to go in 
what kind of aggregates you can choose, how do I choose those family of aggregates. So choosing the binder, choosing the aggregates and then proportioning the mix so that all the contrasting requirements are satisfied. So we will go one by one. The first strategy is to design the paste and this is the most crucial strategy not because nobody knows how to design paste but because you have so many different combinations of materials that you can choose for paste. So the first idea should be what is locally available. Everybody has cement, slag is generally available, fly ash is generally available, silica fume metacalin are not very hard to get. Lot of times people use ground quartz, they take quartz and grind it really fine to improve the reactivity. We stayed away from the ground quartz story because it is very expensive and also it is not very locally available. If I want to ask a ready mix company to manufacture UHPC, they will manufacture only with the locally available materials. It is very difficult for them to source ground quartz, have a different silo for that and, and be able to process it. So I will show you two methods or actually combine one method which will help you design any kind of paste. Okay, so, this is a very generalized method that you can use for any kind of paste that you want to use for ultra high performance applications and we rely on two different uh, requirements. One as you see on the, on the right packing of particles and the other one on flowability or rheology. So, these are the two things that we will look at um, and then the second strategy is on packing aggregates and I will give you a strategy and a methodology to actually pack aggregates and then put paste and aggregates together to form the material that you want. Okay. So we have like I said different types of materials and then so you see here cement uh, median size of 11.2, slag a median size of 8.9, fly ash a median size of 17.9 microns, metacal 5.3. Silica fume I did not even show it in the picture because it is submicron uh, if you completely deagglomerate it. And then we use two different limestone powders of 3 micron and 1.5 micron uh, size. Now, and most of you would know now because I have limestone, I use metacalin because I have now the limestone alumina synergy, which is typically the LC3 story. So limestone is used so that you can have alumina also from metacalin, you can have combination of limestone and alumina to react better, that will be a better strategy than using silica fume even though we have used silica fume also. <laughs> so what, hap what we did is the, with the available materials we designed a, a large number of systems of paste mixes, actually 33 in this study, um, very low water binder ratio 0.24 we actually went down even further. 1.25 percent of a high range water reducing admixture, a polycarboxylate based water reducing admixture, 1.25 percentage of solids by mass of binder which actually translates to about 5 percent of superplasticizer by mass of cement, 5 percent. So I will show you how to add that also. If you have 5 percent of superplasticizer, you mix it with all the available water and you pour it in, you are going to get one large clump nothing is going to happen and I will show you mixing methods that need to be changed if you want to design such mixes. Okay, so packing, so we did some computational work and, and again this does not have to be computational if you, if you know what you are using but we want to do a wide range of materials so that we can start looking at packing of all these materials in different spaces. So if you see the, the bottom leftmost picture that has only two sides of particles, you, can, you have only say cement and fly ash maybe. If you go to the next one, I have introduced another size of particles or red particles maybe that is metacalin. If you go further down, I have green particles maybe that is limestone. So what you see is as I sequentially increase the number of particles and change the size of particles, I get completely different packing. right? And then in the graph <coughs> on the right side, I have plotted three different parameters, three very important very useful parameters of microstructure which is basically material science parameters that any material, any lattice structure guy would use. First one is a coordination number, coordination number just means the number of nearest neighbors. What is, what are the number of nearest neighbors of each particle? If I take one particle, how many nearest neighbors it has, basically how many particles it has touching. What is the significance? If I have many nearest neighbor particles, that just tells me that the, my packing is much higher. It also tells me 
indirectly that when I have more particles around one cement grain, it is more likely to react because there are reacting species around it. It does not tell me what exactly it is, but it gives me a broader range. Number density will tell me how many particles are there in a unit volume. The more number of particles, the denser the structure, right? Smaller the particles, you will have more number of particles, denser the structure. And then mean centroidal distance, if I take one particle, cement particle, I will know what is the mean centroidal distance between that particle and a like or a dislike particle. So, it could be cement, it could be fly ash, it could be limestone. So, you can categorize all of that and using these three terms, you can come up with a nice idea of how the microstructure is packed. And this is fundamental material science which will help you to design the paste. We do this unknowingly most of the time. You, we select materials without quantifying this, but for an ultra high performance concrete like material, you cannot afford not to quantify it because the, uh, the, the sensitivity is so high that a minor mistakes can change a lot of different things. So, you have to plan that really carefully. The next one is rheology. Because you want to have this thing flowing through a space, right? Because you want to flow this through dense reinforcement, I need to control the rheology. So, I have done yield stress, plastic viscosity and mini slump. The reason we did mini slump is because I cannot tell every lab that designs such mix to have yield stress and plastic viscosity measured using a rheometer. So, I need to give them some simple tool and that is a mini slump. So, do a mini slump flow, right? So, we have rheological parameters. Now, using these two parameters and I showed you these 33 mixes to start with, we define what is called a packing coefficient. Okay. It is just a simple mathematical transformation of those three parameters that I talked about. Coordination number means number of nearest neighbors. More number of nearest neighbors, higher the packing. Therefore, I put that in the numerator. Number density, number of particles in a unit volume. More number of particles, better the packing. Right? Therefore, I put that also in the numerator. Mean centroidal distance the distance between a cement grain and a like or dislike particle. The closer they are, the better packing, which means smaller the distance, better packing. I put that in the denominator. Now, I get a packing coefficient, which is the exaggerated effects of all of these three things, right? Number density, coordination number and mean central distance. You get a packing fraction. And I say, my packing fraction has to be greater than the packing fraction of a, a control mix that has only cement, just to have some kind of a comparison. You can use any comparison tool for, for that. I just said 1. It does not matter, you can say 2 times, you can say 5 times, you can say 0.5 times depending on what you actually need. That is where a designer comes in and says, here is the kind of packing that I would need. I have my comparable material with a plain cement paste, this is a packing, I want 5 times more packing or 8 times more packing, how would I need it? And then for flow, I did the same idea, slum flow area, the more the slum flow area, the larger and the better the flowability. The higher the yield stress, the lower the flowability. The higher the viscosity, lower the flowability. So, I put one in the numerator and the other two in the denominator, but if you do that, yield stress plastic viscosity, if you remember those numbers are very different, right? and this, you will get large unyieldly numbers for people to think and remember. So, I put in a square root to make sure that numbers lie between 1 and 10. For people to remember it quickly and make sure that this is a tool that somebody can use. Again, there is no logic for why a square root is. If the numbers were even larger, I would have made a cube root. Right? Just to understand and make sure that you can think of these numbers fairly quickly and in comfortable manner. And now, I do Venn diagrams. The first Venn diagram is for packing. So, I, I get 22 mixtures that satisfy all the criteria. You see that in the middle? 22 mixtures that satisfy all the criteria. 23 mixtures uh, from this list that satisfy all the rheology criteria. And then I do a union of those and I get 17 mixtures that satisfy both the criteria. And those 17 mixtures are seen, are shown in green in the box below. Now, if I change the gammas and the kappas in packing and flow coefficient, you can reduce the number of mixes you want. You say that, okay, 
my kappa is greater than 0.25 times um, UHP control. No, I actually want 0.5. You will reduce the range. I want packing is 1 times UHP control. No, I want packing twice better than the control mix. I will still reduce the mix, right. So, now this gives the designer a tool to play around. So, now you are not shooting in the dark, you are actually choosing exactly how you want your, your um, packing and flow to give you properties and you select mixes. Now, I can add one more qualification criteria, I can add a qualification criteria for cost, minimize the cost among these binders. Once the first two criteria is satisfied, I can put in a third criteria and all of this, the advantage of all of this is you can write a computer program to do all of this which makes it much easier now to select a mix rather than going to the lab and doing 250 trials and finally coming back with one or two which may not may or may not work. Now, it is a much more rational and much more sensible strategy to understand what is happening. So, that is a binder qualification criteria. We did Morta strengths and you can see that uh, we can get up to 150 mega Pascal strength at 28 days. This is 35 percent aggregates and 65 percent paste that is not a typo. You normally see it the other way in mortars and concrete. This is 35 percent aggregate, 65 percent paste. You need that amount of paste to satisfy the workability and the strength criteria. Okay. Um, and we get 170 mega Pascals after 90 days with all these mixes which have 30 percent cement replacement. So, that is fairly, fairly good. Now, aggregate packing. <coughs> so, how do you do aggregate packing? If I have one size of aggregate, the best I can do is to get a packing fraction of 0.91. If I have one size, the best I can do with small size aggregates. But if I start adding more and more, you have separation effects, you have spacing differences and stuff, your packing fractions will start to come down. Again, this is not applicable to all sizes, this is applicable to really small sizes, really small sizes of micron scale that we are talking about. If you look at uh, uh, hexagonal close packing, you get 0.74, that is theoretical maximum packing. This you can, you can manipulate and put in a few more sizes and, and, and get to a higher value. What happens when you have irregularly shaped aggregates, the challenges with ir irregularly placed? So, we have something called a virtual maximum packing density. We want as much of aggregates in concrete as possible because aggregates give you dimensional stability, aggregates will control the shrinkage, aggregates will give you better properties, aggregates will give you higher elastic modulus. So, you want all of these, but then to pack these aggregates well is a challenge because the shape and the size are very different. So, um, what we did is for UHPC, we said okay, we are not going to go to aggregates of size more than number 4. Number 4 is 4.75 millimeters, passing 9.36 retained on 4.75 that is number 4. Number 8 is passing 4.75 retained on 2.36 and number 10 is passing 2.36 retained on 1.18. So, 4, 8 and 10 those are the only aggregates that we used and two different sands a coarse sand with a median size of 0.6 mm, a fine sand with a median size of 0.2 mm and then steel fibers uh, 0.2 mm diameter and 13 mm. So, what we did is we separated uh, all these aggregates into different sizes because you really have to pack them well, you separate them into different sizes and then use what is called the compressible packing model. Again, you have to figure out a way to pack the aggregates, um, the, the derivations are there in the publications that we have done, I will give you a list of that at the end. Uh, so, it is not very complicated, you can again uh, put this in a computer program and do and have all the choices made. So, you select a compaction index k, you can say that okay, I am, I am compacting it really well. So, a number of 9 is typically used and then um, that is a function of the virtual packing densities of the mix, the packing density of each of these aggregate classes, the volume fraction of each of those aggregate classes and all of that. And then I have two different coefficients a i j and b i j that will take care of the loosening effect. So, if I have a large aggregate that gets in between the small aggregates, it loosen the structure, right. So, I have to account for that and then I have to account for the wall effect. When I have aggregates placed along the wall, I will not get the maximum packing density. So, I have to account for those two effects also. And then um, you have to find out the measured packing density of each of the aggregate classes. This is the only lab experiment that you have to do for that. For each of those sizes, 
you find out what is the actual maximum packing density by doing a dry rotted unit weight test in the lab okay and that will give you a maximum packing density. So, what this model does is using all of those and the equations I showed you earlier, it calculates what is called the random packing density. Okay? So, packing density if you do a packing randomly, randomly meaning you throw in, you close your eyes, pick up a particle and throw in the box until the box gets filled. It is not selectively by opening the eyes and placing one next to the other where you can actually fill in space, no you are doing it randomly. So, the random packing density will always be lower than the maximum available or maximum possible packing density. And then because in real life you put the aggregates randomly right you do not place them one by one, but then what you do you place them and then you compact concrete. The process of compaction takes care of some of the effects of random packing by moving things into spaces that were present right. So, then you add the compaction index to account for the compaction process to get you the actual packing density that is what is in the field. And then you are assuming that all these particles have equal density, particles may not be spherical, but you have to make some um, adjustments for that. So, here is a compressible packing model get all the different sizes of aggregates that you want. You get the dry rotted unit weight for each of those class of aggregates put all of them in the compressible packing model along with a particle size distribution come up with random packing densities. If you do that you will get random packing densities this is some plots for 885 different aggregate combinations MATLAB code we will do it in 2 seconds 885 different aggregate combinations and you plot packing density the uh, random packing density as a function of volume fraction of different aggregates and you can find out where is the maxima in the packing density for different combinations. Based on those combinations I am showing you a snapshot of those combinations you pick up the one with the maximum packing density in this case it is 0.696 where I have 40 percent of number 4, 10 percent of number 8, 10 percent of number 10, 20 percent of concrete sand which is 0.6 mm and 20 percent of fine sand which is 0.2 mm right. Now, do not ask me why 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, why cannot it be 0 0.38, 0 0.265, 0 0.4, you can. But if I am co going to give this to a ready mix concrete operator, I am better off giving him numbers like this rather than telling him 26 and a half percent, 32 and a half percent because he is going to make mistakes. So, it is better to stick to numbers where somebody can actually produce those concrete with minimal complications. You can get to as many significant digits as you want, you can you can you can do this in, in as much of a refinement as you want if you want to in the lab. If you say that 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 I think it will be 0 0.38, 0 0.08, 0 0.12 all power to you, you might be able to do that. But again practically it is not a great idea. So, that is a proposed solution you get a recommended blend of aggregates um, and then you, uh, you see this in the table number 57, number 68, 78, 89 this is how they call aggregate piles in the US. So, again communication if I have to tell the guy in the ready mix plan to I cannot tell them number 4 so much, number 8 so much, he will say what to do with my number 57 because that is the packing that is the gradation that he has. So, I should tell him ok number 57 will give you roughly a packing density between 0 0.55 and 0 0.62, what should I augment in 57 to get him what I want or if he says I have only number 78, what should I augment in 78 to get what I want. So, again it is more a practical idea of how to communicate to somebody the mix plant on what aggregate combinations you need. Fibers, if you incorporate these long fibers in this matrix of aggregates, the fibers are going to display some of the aggregates right. You are going to have a lower packing any time you put in something of a different aspect ratio and you will see that here in this picture you can see the maximum packing density is reduced a little. The, with the addition of fibers, but then the advantages that the fibers gives us so much right, in terms of ductility you live with it. You say that okay, that is a necessary evil that I have to take with and you live with it. So, here are the final mixture compositions, I used the selected aggregate combination that I showed you here 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 by mass of all these aggregates and two different paste mixes, one with fly ash 
microsilica and limestone sorry fly ash metacal and limestone and the second one with limestone and silica fume uh, two different mixes with and without fibers um, with a water cement ratio of 0 0.16 to 0 0.18 and a superplasticizer dosage of 1.25 percent by weight of the binder of all the powders that is about 5 percent by weight including the liquid content of the superplasticizer. Okay, just show you some pictures or scaled up mixtures and show you how we can actually do this. So, washed and dried aggregates, aggregates added to the mixture, fine aggregates added, mixing water added to the aggregate to attain the saturated surface dry condition. So, adjust for that and then mix it together and blend all the aggregates together. Add silica fume first, why? Because you want to break down the silica fume agglomerates, right? Silica fume will clump. So, you put the silica fume in, you mix with and, and make silica fume dispersed, then you add limestone because limestone is the next larger size, again you see larger, larger, larger. Then you add, uh, mix this well so that you get a good mix, then add fly ash, then add first one third of water and superplasticizer, mix it, second one third of water and superplasticizer. So, you have added two thirds of the water and two thirds of superplasticizer and see how the mix looks like once you add them that is a right bottom mix. And then between that and the next one you see the difference that is purely by high shear mixing. You have just mixed it for 5 to 7 minutes at extremely high shear to break all the particles to release the water from all the agglomerates and now <coughs> La, then you add the last one third of water and the superplasticizer and you see the mix being extremely fluid and then you add steel fibers and mix it and I will show you the mix is so good that even with that flowability there is absolutely no bleeding or segregation and you see a very cohesive very dense mix and, and it is very hard to believe that this is a 0.16 water cement ratio mix. So, that is the you need long mixing times, you need intense mixing and you need uh, to mix for longer periods of time at high shear. So, now you have a good ultra high performance concrete mix which we designed from first principles by packing the particles, by controlling the rheology, by selecting aggregates of sizes so that you can have all those properties satisfied.